in the fact that the film was shot in a little, around two weeks, about eight days and then some extra days here and there. And it seems a very accomplished film to be shot. I mean, I've shot a short film in eight days. And to shoot something that's so clearly thought out, uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the journey to the film. And you've been working on this since 2006. Uh, and I just wanted uh, to sort of begin by this, this question about, you know, working on a film for seven years um, and, and how you conceived of uh, compositions that are just, you know, seem like they would take weeks to think out, but you shot this in eight, essentially eight days. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you very much for staying around when the weather's so fabulous outside. Um, yeah, w this will began in 2006 as part of a greater project, um, uh, a project about a man sent to war, he experienced that war, birthplace of trauma, and then when he returns home, how that trauma continues to affect his life. Um, during the process, in some point, we decided to split the film up into different editions. So what you see here is essentially the first part of the film, um, the first part of the story, uh, and we've made it into its own in film. Um, but in terms of how we captured it, we, we, we spent probably two, three months in the jungle in Singapore. Uh, my cinematographer, my gaffer, my production designer and I basically blocking out where we would film uh, and how we would capture the jungle. Not so much as a backdrop, but as a character that has many different aspects um, and, and uh, personalities. Kind of like um, making a film in a house and it's set in several different rooms. We wanted each part of the jungle to look and feel different so it, it wasn't um, just, just, a, just a green backdrop. So we start off in the mangroves, we move into sub uh, tropical, or subtropical jungle and then into uh, the full-on jungle surrounded by Chinese graves. Um, and we I think for me that the really interesting decision in, in choosing to film in Singapore was the graves, the Chinese graves that you can maybe see in part of the film, um, were all, all real textures in the Singapore jungle. Um, and for me and a lot of the crew that added some spiritual texture to uh, the character of the jungle that we were trying to capture, we, we wanted to, to make the space feel not like um, <clears throat> just, just nature, but something that had a soul and, a, and was a character that as the Australian soldier moves through the film, he almost becomes conscious of, the, of this presence. And we learn by the end of the film that, that it has such an effect on him that you can imagine this, this space would, would stay with him for the rest of his life. I think, I, I think you bring up an interesting point because when I was watching this film, I actually appreciated the beginning of the film because it is introducing the jungle as its own character, first through an oral experience and then through the visual experience. And I wanted to touch upon the uh, sound design by Nick Buchanan and Rodney Lowe a bit. And how, I mean, with a film that's essentially silent, I mean, there's, you know, a few lines of dialogue throughout the whole running time. How closely and how planned out, I guess, beforehand was the sequence of how the sound editing was uh, basically how did you approach this because I think I feel like because this is your first feature uh, and a lot of times I feel like sound is sort of the last thing thought of in first features and it seems in this case it was one of the most important aspects of the film and I, uh, I just want to ask about the relationship between the sound design team and yourself um, I've worked with these sound designers on a few short films and on a lot of commercials. Um, but they came on board because I needed to do about seven, eight months worth of sound design. And we had very, very little money. We had no money. Um, and they said, yes, we'll do it. So uh, I was very grateful that they could not only achieve it, but, but we came up with something that was so collaborative and so strong. Um, that their work really stands out for me in the film as, as, as um, it isn't just a, a something you add on to the top of the cinematography or on top of the acting, it's something that was from the beginning 
pretty much integral to the, the structure of the film. So my short films have really been reliant on sound design to drive the narrative and, and the story. Um, and it's the same for this feature because I, I was living in Singapore for about three years when the story came to me. Um, and it was hearing the stories of people who were in this landscape during the war, in addition to me being in this world and hearing the, the sounds of the jungle and, and being immersed in this world, um, I wanted to create something that made you feel like you were in the space with this character, that you were going through his experiences, that the dialogue you see, you don't understand what they're saying because you don't speak that language. So you're relying on the sounds around you to carry the emotion of, of the film. Um, so we, we recorded a lot of the textures in the actual jungle itself. Um, I sat in the middle of the jungle or the mangroves or on the hill at 3 a.m. with a, a little dat, rec not dat recorder, um, mm -hmm. what they call it, a zoom recorder. And I just recorded hours and hours of sounds so that when we got back to the sound mix, we would add those into the, into the soundtrack instead of using library music. Uh, and then we would also distort them so it would sound like um, at times the jungle is, is kind of mimicking the sound of the war in the background to sort of play with the characters. Um, and as the film moves on, the sounds become less organic and more mechanical as we kind of play with and, and mix those sounds together. I'd like, to open, uh, I'd like to open it up to audience questions. Uh, are, there, are there any questions? No? Okay. I will... Con oh, wait, sir. Uh, it's a stunning film. And the, the, to, from an audience point of view, to be able to stick with the film, which has nothing but nature. I mean, it's, the, it's all about... For me, it's all about nature, the human beings, the jungle, the sound, the thing. Where did you find that kind of discipline... Uh, was it your previous work? Was it this kind of nature um, visualization or to drive a narrative? I did everyone hear the question? Uh, the question was, where did you find the discipline to sort of stick with this rather, uh, this film that's essentially about nature and silent? And as an audience member, uh, it, 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 he was wondering, how did you find this discipline to create such a, an immersive experience? Um, thank you, first of all. Um, uh, I think two, twofold. It comes from my background growing up in a small country town where I was quite a fair ways from town. You grew up um, immersed, by, immersed in nature, surrounded by um, livestock and animals in the bush, and you get to appreciate the landscape, um, the wide open spaces, but also the bush along the river. Um, I used to take a lot of photography, so it would, I guess my upbringing in that sort of world informed me about landscape and environment as character, as, as a world that is sort of um, is overpowering. It's an immense presence that you know, informs you in your daily life. Um, in terms of my filmmaking, I've kind of got quieter and quieter with the short films I've made. They've not necessarily had less dialogue for the sake of it, but I've, I've, I've inadvertently opened up the... the the world in my short films to the, to, the, to the natural world around us. So my film just before this was a short film about uh, an asylum seeker, an Afghan refugee, and he comes to Australia and he's put into a detention centre. And it's basically a barren, dry landscape, there's no greenery, and there's a lot of wind. Um, so these guys are in these little buildings, exposed to the elements, very dry and inhospitable, and it affects the character's um, you know, psychology. Uh, they become very depressed, they don't communicate to one another. Uh, before that, it was a film about the connection between uh, two elderly survivors of World War II and how they live their lives now in their separate environments, one in modern-day Singapore, one in country Australia. So I, I like the idea of environment as, as something that really affects how we live our lives and how we, how we relate to one another. Uh, and I just expanded on that in the film, I think. Um, it was taking the idea of the story, many stories of, of, of people talking to me about their experiences of war, in, particularly in Singapore, um, and supplanting on that the idea of these characters being lost in a world that they don't understand, that's quite hostile, and that ultimately becomes something that will reshape them as, as individuals. Like a, 
for me it feels like this, this character, when he pierces the jungle, that he, he's, he's sort of reborn. He will never be the same again. He will not be the same young boy that he was going in. Um, and, I, and I... One thing that stuck with me when I spoke to, to veterans and war survivors about their experiences in war was when they spoke about the vulnerability as individuals being in situations where they weren't with friends, they weren't in a big group, there wasn't a lot of fighting going on, they were, they were left to their own devices where they could actually think about the predicament they were in. Um, and for someone who's never been to war, it was an in for me to get an understanding of how it must feel like for someone to go through a traumatic experience, an experience like that where um, they would never forget that world, they would never forget that situation, it would stay with them for the rest of their lives and, and um, they would never be able to tell anybody else about it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, two questions. One is, could you talk about the photograph that is shared? Um, is it a, just what, it's, what it is in the film? And the second is the casting. Um, the certain qualities that each of the actors brought to the... And how did you work with those actors? So the question was about... first. The first question was about uh, the photograph that is shared toward the end of the film. And the second question was about... Uh, the casting and how uh, the qualities of the what the qualities of each actor brought to the project. Um, the photograph was inspired by um, an image that one veteran brought to me during an interview we had back in 2005, and it was a picture of him and his little boy and his wife. Uh, and he said it was a picture that he took with him to war, and he had it folded up in his pocket the whole time. Uh, and he remembers showing it to somebody during one, one night where he was stuck between two camps. They couldn't continue because the dark had set in and it was too risky for them to continue on because the Japanese might, might hear them. So him and his friends stopped and they basically sat back to back the whole night. Uh, and if one slept, the other one stayed awake and vice versa. But to get them through the night, instead of talking, they would show each other sort of pictures of their family or they do something physically that, that they could um, they could do without fear of alerting Japanese to their presence. And it was also told, the story he told me was also told under a full moon where they could see what they were doing. So I kind of like that idea of you're at night in a jungle, yet you can see because once your eyes adjust, there's still a lot of light. And I took that and brought that into the film um, because incidentally on the night of February the 9th, uh, there was a full moon in Singapore, oh, so it kind of worked out for me. Um, so I wanted to bring that, that story of, of his photo into the film, that it's something very personal and we don't learn about it till we kind of get to know the character and these characters get to know each other. Um, as far as the acting, I, I work with each of the actors separately. I put them in different parts of the jungle in Singapore. Um, and I didn't really do formal rehearsals. I let them kind of discover the space of the forest themselves. Um, I put Otsu, the Taiwanese actor, in a space where we were going to be filming. So he became very familiar with that, that location. With Khan Chittenden, I put him in a part of the jungle that we were never going to film in, but he didn't know that. So um, <clears throat> when we got to filming, he, would, he was a bit thrown and he's like, isn't this, we haven't been here before. This is totally different to the landscape I was in. And I said, yes, we're not going to where I took you. So he, <clears throat> he, he understood the jungle and he kind of got to appreciate how he would move in that space. But this space I put him in to film, he, he had no idea about the, the landscape, so he would trip and fall. And, whereas the other actor, he, he, he came to understand it like it was, like he'd been there before. And that's what I wanted. I wanted a sense that for the Singapore character, he. He knew this world and this landscape a bit better than the Australian character. And the Australian character at all times felt a bit lost and a bit dazed and, and um, unfamiliar with his surrounds. Yes? What's your next project? Mm -hmm. um, I've got two projects happening at the moment, um, right at the same time. Um, one is a follow-up film to Canopy, uh, not really a sequel, but it, it's... Part of the grand project that I spoke of earlier, where 
in my head it was always a story of someone that goes to war, we experience that birthplace of trauma, and then we see what happens when they return home and the effect of that trauma. So the next film will be the return home and how he how he copes with being at home but whilst part of him is, is still stuck in Singapore. And it's also about his connection with his son in that small town. And it's essentially a father-son story, how the son copes with the father who's, who's emotionally distant. Um, and that was inspired largely by the town that I grew up in and, and the families of people that were affected by their parents or grandparents who were sent to Second World War and Vietnam uh, and came back very affected. Um, the other film is very different. It's um, a thriller set in Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, mm. set during the Hong Kong handover, um, which will feature a mix of um, mainland Chinese, Hong Kong, and British actors. Yes. Um, hi. I thought it was a really powerful yet intimate mm. film, and I think it was really great the way you just focused on the two of them and their relationship. But it's interesting, as an American, I don't know how anybody else here feels, but we don't learn much or anything about the Singaporean role in World War II, or even Australia, for that matter. You know, typically it's about Western Europe and America and Canada and all that, so and Russia. But I just thought it was so interesting, because we don't learn about the, that other part of the world, really. Yeah, there were Australians in many conflicts all over the world that nobody knows about. Um, we were scattered everywhere. Um, even my Taiwanese actor didn't know about the Australians and their involvement in Singapore. Mm. Yet when, Cha when Singapore fell, nine, eight days after this film was set, um, but when it fell to the Japanese, uh, 16,000 Australians were interned in prisoner of war camps for three and a half years. So there were quite a few sent over um, at the whim of the British Empire. But it was pretty much that really incident, bad. that fall of Singapore, that was the inciting incident for Australia cutting ties with the British formally and then mm -hmm. kind of aligning itself closer to America. And that's how we've now got a, like, a close, close um, um, partnership with America because of that situation. But um, for me, I really wanted to, to make the film not so much about backgrounds of these two countries. I, I didn't want to go into the backstory to describe where they'd come from, who these characters were. When we come into the film, we see them as two people from different backgrounds, clearly, but we don't really care what their backgrounds are. Exactly. Uh, and even to the point of not really describing the Japanese as the enemy. They just happen to be a, an enemy force. They're not the Japanese. Um, and to the point where we get to the end of the film and, and we see their faces in close-up, they're, they're essentially just three boys. Um, who, you know, who stripped of uniform um, are, are just people who, who seem incongruous with their settings, with the, the, these boys don't feel like they should be at war. And that's the feeling I wanted to convey. The, yes? Uh, what was the uh, propaganda, was that propaganda that was dropped? Yes. And, and what, what did it say? Because it was, it looked like it might have been in Japanese and in, in another language. Yeah. The question was about the sequence yeah. where he walks through the field and there's the leaflets yeah. through, and it was propaganda that was dropped. And yeah. um, it was propaganda, and it was the Japanese dropped them all over the countryside in Malaya and Singapore, uh, and they were in Chinese and in Malay, and they basically said, "We are your Asian brothers, and we will help you, you know, rid the country of, of these white people. Um, stand with us, and we'll help liberate you." Um, but you know they. They got, they got into, obviously the Chinese who were fighting the Japanese since 1937 didn't buy any of that. But um, I guess they were just hoping to win over anybody they could as they advanced down the peninsula. Um, it, I think it worked in small part in Malaysia, but any sort of sympathy they had garnered was quickly destroyed as they occupied Malaysia and Singapore. But it, for me it was also about um, you know, in America, you've got the idea of the poppy, haven't you? The, the symbolism of the red poppy from World War II. Mm -hmm. In Australia, we, we had a lot of soldiers sent to, to um, the battlefields in France where uh, a lot of Australians were killed, and after the war, a lot of red poppies would sprout from the areas that these guys died. And the red poppy became a symbol of those who had fallen. And every year, we have 
these red poppies, you know, plastic version, paper version, sold during our Remembrance Day as a, you know, as a remembrance. Um, and I like the idea of that, the visual of the red poppy in the field being somehow connected to what we see here. And the idea of these red, sim red dots throughout the green field for me felt like something akin to the poppies that, as Australians, we're used to seeing in, 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 in sort of our film mythology. In the back, yes. I noticed there was a lot of stillness, almost slow motion in the film. I was wondering your thoughts coming back. The question was about the stillness, the stillness of the film and slow motion, and his thoughts about that. It came a lot from uh, speaking with veterans about the idea of being stuck in spaces between battles, um, stuck overnight between camps, waiting to move on, and these being moments when they'd actually stopped to think and they, they had the time to think about where they were. Whereas battles, they described as moments that they can't remember. They would happen so quickly and they'd be over before they knew it. They don't remember the battles that we typically see in films, but they remember really quiet and long drawn out moments when they were feeling very fearful. So I wanted to explore those moments of, of these people these human beings feeling very fearful. And also by, by drawing it out for me, it, 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 it sort of conveyed, it was trying to convey um, a, a, a sense of, not, not so much them being lost, but they weren't on a mission to go from A to B. There was no clear cut decision to go here or do that. Nothing was, was so, nothing seemed so, so um, planned out when I heard these stories. Everything was it, it sort of just happened to be this way, or it sort of evolved, or, you know. For all the, sto all the stories I heard, there was no clear journey for any of these people in any of the stories they told. War just happened and situations evolved and they had to deal with it. So I kind of wanted, I wanted to explore that in the film. Um, but also, the other thing that I wanted to explore was the fragmentation of story. That when I heard these stories from veterans, they would talk about them in, in a dislocated way, as maybe 80, 90 year old men, they would stop in conversation with me and say, oh, hang on, was that the night before or was that earlier? Hang on, I'm mixing up my stories. And they would do this quite a lot. They would mix up their stories and they were remembering things that happened years ago, but they were fragmented. And I kind of wanted to have the journey of these characters throughout the evening become more dislocated and fragmented and even cyclical. They're kind of looping back on themselves, as if the stories over time become non-linear. Mm. Yes. Um, the Australian is put into the truck alive and carried away. The, the Chinese or the Japanese soldier kills a Singaporean soldier. Um, talk about the question is about the ending where the Australian is put into the truck and driven away and the Singaporean, uh, the freedom fighter, is killed by the Japanese soldier. That was just down to what actually happened pretty much in Singapore. Um, the Japanese have been fighting the Chinese for five years before these events happened. Um, and there was a, a real hatred for the Chinese. Um, and anywhere they, they went throughout Asia, there were Chinese nationalists that would resist the Japanese. So their response was to kill the Chinese. With the Westerners, the, I guess the response was they didn't know what to make of these people. They hadn't encountered them in war until this point. So um, there was also um, the question of what to do regarding the Geneva Convention, which was to take prisoners. So. At early on, there was a little bit of do we or do we not obey the Geneva Convention. Um, but ultimately, I think it came down to they didn't know what to do with them. So they rounded them up and put them in prisoner of war camps. Um, whereas the Chinese, particularly in Singapore, they would just shoot on sight. Um, when the Japanese invaded or occupied um, Singapore, uh, there was a two-week period sometime after that called uh, Sok Ching, which is basically um, they went house to house and took young men from families, young Chinese men who were around the ages of 18 and 30, and took them, uh, escorted them away and shot them. And 
estimates range from 50 to 100,000 young Singapore Chinese men were just killed because they were considered a threat to the Japanese occupation in Singapore. So I just really wanted to show a disparity between how the Chinese Singapore, Singapore Chinese were treated and how the, the Western soldiers were treated in Singapore. Uh, I just wanted to briefly talk about uh, the language um, in the film, nothing subtitled. Uh, clearly, the Singaporean is, as we talked about earlier, speaking a dialect. Uh, the Australian soldier barely says anything, and the Japanese soldiers are only speaking in Japanese. Nothing is subtitled. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk about a audience reaction uh, in various places you've sh shown this, and also uh, what it was like to direct multilingual a multilingual crew as well as a multilingual film? Um, the audience reaction, first of all. Yeah. Uh, the, the, throughout different parts of the world, I've been to Toronto, across to Korea, China, Taiwan, Israel, Poland, all over, Brazil. Um, there's been a lot of questions that have been common throughout each country, and I think that has to do with people connecting to the situation of family members being at war and, and the effect it has. The idea that they can see how that experience would affect someone when they returned home. So audience members have spoken a lot about their father or their grandfather who might have had this sort of experience. And it doesn't have to be that kind of war. It's just that that experience seems common throughout the world, regardless of what arena of war it is. Um, and that was interesting for me because that's what I was sort of going for, that the disconnection isn't, isn't really symbolic of specifically Australia and Singapore, it's just the way people from different backgrounds connect in times of war. Um, in terms of... Yeah, different questions. I, I think in Korea, of all places, uh, they brought up, they, they, they sort of asked questions about the connection between soldiers. Is there a, is there a homosexual connection? I think was the question. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I said, well, it's really what you as an audience member bring to the film. Um, for me, it's a film where you strip away language, background, dialogue, and even gender, and you're left with two human beings that, that connect. Um, so it's irrelevant where they're from. It's really what you as an audience member bring to the film. And I said, and if you feel that there's a connection in that way between the two soldiers, then that's, that, that, that's interesting in itself because it's, it's what you as an audience member make that connection to be. Um, and I really wanted to make it something quite generic and quite open for, for audiences to, to bring their own expectations to. Right, and unfortunately, that is, uh, I just got the signal from our house manager. Uh, that is the end of the Q&A. Uh, so everybody, please join me in giving a warm round of applause. Thank you, Aaron, for uh, all the way from... Okay, uh, from coming all the way from Melbourne to join us here for this Q&A. Thank you. And if you want to find out more about the film or see where else it's screening, uh, our Facebook page, which is slash Can It Be The Film, um, feel free to check it out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.